We're going to do the first lesson of 103, and so that's what we're, our goal is. Every third 102 lesson, we're going to do a 103 lesson, and we're just going to intersperse all the way through that. And as we said earlier, this 103 lesson is, is going to start in Bible 102, and it's going to go through to Acts, Romans, and Ephesians as we're, as we're tracking all the way through. And what we're going to look at, 103 is going to unpack Jesus' definition of a disciple from the Gospels and enable believers to study God's word for themselves. That's the goal of, of, 10, of 103, building. And what it's going to do, and we're kind of using the analogy, it probably breaks down a little bit, but the Gospels are kind of like that subfloor that the, floor, that, that the Acts, Romans, the rest of God's word can stand on as we learn to personally engage with God's word ourselves. And so God desires that every believer will come to, will be maturing in Christ, being able to make disciples. And so that's his goal, that's his desire. And just as physical growth for a child is a process, so too it is for us as spiritual children. It's a process that God wants to take us on up into. And God is progressively transforming us. This is his work in us, and this is what his work is. This is his work. So take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter 1 Peter chapter 2. And what we're going to be, what we're going to be beginning, and you guys are kind of a huge guinea pig on this, the, the vision for this um, 103 began amongst the men. And because as we sent out our, our first Bible teachers, not having this Gospels 103 piece, they had got through to Ephesians. As our first teachers went out to plant their first church, you know what they struggled with? the truths that Christ built into his disciples for those three years of his ministry and how to study God's word for themselves. And so we're adding that to it because of a real need in a real church plant. And I'll just throw this piece up here. On Monday, I had the privilege of, of talking to one of the key Bible teachers amongst the men, and he's out doing some translation work at Hoskins where Dan and Teresa lived. And it was just so incredible to hear what God is doing there amongst the Mangan. Just the maturing. There's no missionaries that live there anymore. They're completely running and leading three churches. The churches at the home, the base church is just full to overflowing as young people are clamoring. They're having to do a a new Bible 101. They're teaching in Acts and they're teaching in Romans. Three different tracts. They're happening simultaneously. And uh, and so it was so cool to hear stories of, of this person that hadn't come to a clear confession of faith while we were there. But now they've come to clarity and this one's come to clarity and this one's come to clarity and and a depth and a maturing because of God's word and engaging them with the truth of God's word and um, so it's really cool it was just so neat to hear that that our spiritual children are walking walking in truth and uh, just doing so well and so I appreciate your continued prayers for them so it's first Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 you got you got it there Jake please go ahead and read that like newborn babies Crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Okay, so as a child, so as a child physically grows to the level of the nutrition that he receives, so too it is for spiritual children. We need the right spiritual nutrition from God's word in order that we're going to grow into maturity. So as one, and one of the signs of a mature believer is their ability to personally engage with God's word themselves. To the level that we can engage personally is the level that we're maturing in Christ. There's a huge connection point, and we're going to get into that as we go along. If we have to rely on somebody else to feed us, then our maturity is going to be stunted. So a mature believer is able to do that. And so thus in 103, we're going to begin walking through that. And so in 103, we're going to look at these two truths here. Every believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ who follows him in all of life. Number two, the study of God's word is crucial because through it, God engages us with, uh, with Christ, the living word. And so in every Bible 103 lesson, it's going to have two tracks, part of it. One is, what is the disciple? Is Christ defined it? And then secondly, how do we study God's word? And so those are the tracks that's going to go through. So every believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ who follows him in all of life. So take your Bibles and let's go to the last words of Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, just before Christ ascended back to heaven, these were the last words that he gave to his disciples. And so just to anchor everything in truth, let's go to the truth of God's word here. We're kind of starting at the end of the Gospels, but and then, and then as we're going to go along, we're going to go back to the beginning, but just kind of see, see where the truth of this is as a disciple of Christ. Matthew chapter 28, um, verses um, 18 to 20. Okay, go ahead and read that, please. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, so what was Jesus commanding his followers, his disciples, to do in Matthew 28? What was he commanding them to do? Very simply, make this, go make disciples, okay? What else? Not just make disciples, but then as they got a disciple, what was the next part? Teach them, yeah, what else? Obey. To obey. And then, what was in the middle of all of that? Baptize, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus desires, desires disciples from all nations, not just converts. Now, we need to understand this truth. There's a huge difference. Through God's word, there's no place for just a convert. I got the ticket for heaven. Now they're just going to slide through to heaven and, that's, and just kind of slide through. No, Christ raises the bar that every person who's come to Jesus has come by faith in Jesus Christ is automatically a disciple. So what kind of disciples does Christ uh, desire? How does he define what a disciple is in Matthew 28? What are some of the characteristics? I think we talked about a little bit, but let's just make sure that we're understanding. What's the characteristics that, he's, that he lays out as to what a disciple, one of his disciples looks like? We already said just a couple of them. Just reiterate them. One, they're going to be from... All, all, all languages, all ethnics, it's, that's a disciple. It's going to be broad. It's going to, be, it's going to represent the whole uh, people across, um, across the earth. What other characteristics does he lay out there of a disciple? Yeah, they're baptized. What else? Taught. 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 Word. Obeying him. Obeying him as well, right? And so all of that is there. So did Jesus intend this mandate just be for his original disciples? Is that, like, that's who he's talking to in the context here. So he's speaking to his 12 disciples. Was this a mandate just for his disciples? No. So how do we know this was not just a mandate for his original disciples? Because you're going to teach them to observe all of his words. That includes this one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so Jesus is commanding his original disciples to do what? Make more of them. And so as we make more of those disciples, then those disciples are going to do what? are going to make more and is soon going to cover and go to the, to the ends of the earth. This will be a process that will make disciples of all nations. So this is huge. Our coming to faith is not the end. It's only the beginning. And we need to understand the bar that God puts there, that there's no place in his, in his um, uh, kingdom, as it were, for somebody sitting on the sidelines. Every believer is automatically a disciple of Jesus Christ who is to follow and obey Jesus in all of life. And so for our teaching, we're going to use this this definition here from a, a guy by the name of Jeff Vanderstelt. It says, a disciple of Jesus Christ is a believer who's ever increasingly worshiping Jesus in all of life, changed by Jesus in all of life, obeying Jesus, obeying Jesus in all of life, and teaching others to do the same. We're going to use this definition to define what it is. Now, how much of this work is, is up to the disciple to make work? Do you, notice that, do you notice the tenses that are used in this particular definition? I think it's quite biblical. Do you notice that? A disciple of Jesus is a believer who is ever increasingly worshiping as changed by Jesus in all of life. And so there's a work of, of God in the life of the believer. So let me just pin this up here. It's not very big, but um, I think we'll be able to see it there. So a disciple of Jesus Christ who's ever increasingly worshiping Jesus in all of life. So now let's dig into Jesus, what, how Jesus envisioned his discipleship process to go. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 28 and uh, verses 18 to 20 once again. I'll read it here. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So I believe that in this passage is kind of a, a process, a, a, a process, a chronological process, step by, first, a step by step. First of all, is to make disciples, weren't they? Secondly, they were to baptize. Thirdly, and then they were to be taught all that Jesus commanded. And yet in this process of being a, a disciple of Christ, we're also in this process to be going to make other disciples. We're in part of a dynamic relationship that's ongoing as a disciple of Christ. We're now making more as we're, as we're progressing through it. Notice that each believer is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So baptize, baptism may be a new word for some of us, but in reality what it really means is simply to immerse in water. In other words, believers were to be immersed or baptized as a public declaration that they are now a disciple of Christ. It doesn't save them, it doesn't add, but it's that outward declaration that they're acknowledging they're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now God's going to reveal more about that as we go along in his word. But baptism also has another meaning to it that we need to consider. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 declares, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. So the moment that we repented of our sin and put our faith in the finished work of Christ, God immersed us into God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's a relationship that comes through that. And as a disciple, being as a disciple maker, my job and our job is, is to immerse our disciples fully into the relationship with God the Father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, that they will grow in that relationship there, that they will grow in their understanding of who they are in that identity in their relationship with God the Father, their relationship and their identity with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's desiring to do through the teaching of his word. So let me try to illustrate um, what God desires in our new relationship with him and the intimacy that he, that he desires through that. So think about a, mar- a loving married couple. What is the difference between them as a newlywed versus 30 years of marriage? What's the difference? What was the difference between a loving married couple when they became newlyweds versus, versus after 30 years? What's the difference? How would you describe it? You, you um, those who have been married for many years. What's the difference between a newlywed and a couple who's been married for 30 plus years? What's the difference? There's a growing intimacy that happens, right? Many couples would not never want to go back. A loving couple would never want to go back to newlywed because there's so much more intimacy. There's so much more sweetness. The same is true for a new believer in Christ. They're like a newlywed. Yes, they're fully married and enjoying the blessing of their new relationship with Christ, but their intimacy with God will only grow and get sweeter. This will take time, uh, take time as they engage with God through his word and as they allow themselves to be taught and to be mentored as we see in Matthew 28. It's going to get sweeter just in that intimacy of a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So as we look at this particular chart of what God has provided for us as believers, if we're a new believer in Christ, it's going to seem like incredible. How can this ever happen? Overwhelming. But the reality is, as we go on in God's word, as we're more and more immersed in who we are in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we're, God is going to take us on up and in to all that is ours in that richness of the relationship with who God is. That's what he's going to take us into. And the sweetness and the, and the richness will continue to dawn on us. So how will a deeping, deepening, loving relationship with God enable us to make more disciples? Matthew 28 talks about we're to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So as we deepening into this loving relationship with God, as that's deepening, as we're immersed, will that help us make more disciples? I believe so, right? How? How so? Yeah, why? Why will they be drawn to it? Yeah, absolutely, because there's going to be a contentment, there's going to be a joy as well. Will it not also give a message of purpose, healing, and hope that's contrary to the helplessness and the hopelessness that the world is facing as they're dead in Adam? Isn't that going to shine like a bright light and and drawing and wanting that? And so there's a richness that comes through. So disciples of Jesus are to be immersed into all the richness of their relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as they're taught all that God commanded, it's no longer a stick that drives them to to obedience. Rather, as that richness of that relationship grows, they're going to be drawn to want to obey him. They're going to be drawn to want to follow Christ. And as that wanting and the sweetness is going to draw them through. So let me illustrate, try to illustrate what I mean. So think about a loving marriage where the husband is a long-haul truck driver. So as he leaves for a month, does his wife have to worry what he's going to do as he interacts with the other sex, opposite sex? No, why? Why would, why would the wife not have to really worry? Because she trusts him. Why would she trust him? Because she loves him. 
And because, think of it, the intimacy of the relationship is going to guard that husband of how he interacts. He's going to walk with integrity because the sweetness of his relationship with his wife is going to set boundaries for him that he wants to do nothing to hinder the sweetness of, of that relationship. The deeper the intimacy, the greater the care is to protect it. And that's what God seeks to, to lay out for us. This is also true for believers. Obedience to Christ is a result of the depth of our relationship with him. Think about what drew us as we were in broken in our... Think about what drew us from our pride and from our sin. What drew us to want to humble ourselves about our sin and put our faith in the finished work of Christ. Wasn't it God... Has God revealed who he was in his character? As we understood his love, his desire and his pursuit of us, did that not draw us to want to humble ourselves before him? Did God not use that powerfully and as we understood his grace, his intensity, and the thoroughness of what he provided? And then we've already had a taste of God's goodness and his rescue and all the desires in a relationship. This same test is going to create a thirst and a desire for more and for more. And we want to go deeper and deeper into who God is in his character because he's so richly blessed us and he's going to draw us into all that he has. Remember, true freedom comes from submission to God and his word. And that's where he's taking us. He's leading us to wholeness. He's leading us to life. And it's centered in his word as we bow before him. Now, Matthew 28 ends off with a huge promise for us as believers. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, um, and the promise that God gives as we go to make in this discipleship process. As we go to make disciples, God makes a huge declaration. Verse 20. Go ahead and read that, please, Jake. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Okay, so what does Christ promise us as we're going to make disciples? What's the promise that he gives to us? Mm -hmm. How long will he be with us? Always. Like, well, like why, would, why would you think that God would want us to understand the surety and surely... Like, why would he have to strengthen? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Like, why is the repetition? Why is the, why is the emphasis there? What, what's he hoping to accomplish here? What's he want us to see? Sitting here right now in Ozer, what does he want us to see? He wants to have an everlasting relationship. Yes. Not, yeah, he wants to have an everlasting relationship. But think about this. In this context, is God is commanding us to go and be making disciples of all nations. That's the task that he's given to us. So as we're going to do that, why do you think God would want to declare, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age? Like, what's he hoping to accomplish? What does he want us to see here? Yes. Yes, he's the all-powerful God. We're not going to do it in our own strength, and we're going to go forward with confidence. So think about this. Who's making this promise? Huh? God is the one who is incredible, all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God is making the promise to each and every one of us, surely I am with you. And God wants us to understand in the thick and the thin of battle, as we're going out making disciples, he wants us to understand that he's with us and he will empower us. He's going to enable us to do what he's asked us to do. So here's another question. How can God make this promise to millions of believers spread all over the world? Isn't it kind of a crazy promise? Because it's not just us sitting here. It's to every believer that's out making disciples the world over. How can he make that promise? Sorry? He's God. He's everywhere present. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He knows everything. And so he can make that declaration and we can rest in it knowing that, he, that, he, that he's there. So think about it. A believer is never alone. God Almighty has promised to go with us as we make disciples, as we're in the trench, whether it's in a factory or whether it's in a school or wherever it is, as we're there in the thick of the battle making disciples in those trenches, who's with us? God is with us. And you know what? Even better, God has laid out his word in such a way that it's for all cultures, for all peoples. Every people can engage with the truth of his word. He's given us a resource 
that will make disciples of all nations. And God goes even one better. If you were to go over to Revelation chapter 5, I think it's verse 9, God makes a promise that when we and each of us are standing around his throne, who's going to be there with us? Some from every tribe, tongue, and nation. God has declared it proof positive that his disciple-making process will bear fruit as he's declared it. Isn't that incredible? And so what we as believers are about is something that is, that is, that is going to guarantee, as guaranteed fruit. And we can go forward with confidence, believing our God is with us and he will empower us. So we've been making applications as we're going along, but just let's just sharpen this a little bit. So, Jake, at what point did you become a disciple of Jesus Christ? When I accepted him as my Savior. At that very moment? Is that true for every last one of us? Martin, when did you become a disciple of Jesus Christ? When I accepted Christ. Yes, at that moment of repentance and faith, wasn't it? At that very moment, we became a disciple of Jesus Christ. God declares that each and every believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ. So based on Jesus' command in Matthew here, what does that mean for us? See it here right now. If every last one of us is a believer in Jesus Christ, is a disciple of Christ, what do we take away from this passage here in Matthew 28? What does that mean for, for, for each of us sitting here? We have a mandate. Is this an option to be considered? Is this an option? No, this is a, what is it? It's a commandment by who? God himself, the one who rescued us, the one who redeemed us, this is an option. This is not an option, excuse me. This is a commandment to live out through rule of life. This is our primary objective and needs to be our focus in everything. It's not going to the factory as the focus. As I'm going to the factory, that's the platform God has given me to make disciples. If I'm going to the office, no, I'm not going to the office to do my job. I'm going to the office to make disciples. That's my mandate before God. Whether I'm going to school, I'm not just going to school, I'm going there to make disciples. If I'm going on holidays, I'm not just going on holidays, I'm going to make disciples. If I'm involved in sports, I'm not just there to do sports, I'm, it's a platform God's given to make disciples. That's the truth of God's word. And we as believers need to write that across every area of our lives. So as we embrace our orders, then we'll need to see how to fulfill them. As we go forward, this can seem daunting, but is it an impossible task? Is it an impossible task? No, why isn't it an impossible task? Because you'll be with us, sorry, what'd you say, Bonnie? Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Come back to the truth of his word and, and say, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The reality is, not only will he be with us, but he's also laid out the process of how to make disciples. And so we just need to humble ourselves to his process, and he will enable us as we go making disciples. And so that's the reality, and that's the mandate, and that's one of the reasons why in Explore 1010, we put that up at the top. That's our goal in everything, is, is not just um, understanding the fullness of life, that abundant life in Christ. That abundant life in Christ is that maturing, making more disciples. And that's why we've been going through Bible 101. That's why we've been going to go through, we're going through 102 and, and 103, and we're going to continue on, because the goal is, and the mandate God's given to us in Matthew, is to be helping believers to go on to maturity and making more disciples. That's the task that he's given to us. And that's why we're doing what we're doing in this process of walking through, understanding the message. So we have clarity of the message as we're asked. And that's why we're doing Equip 1010. That's why a number of you seated here are part of that training process. And, and again, that's open for every believer who wants to be equipped how to teach God's word in every context. We have our testimony too, don't we? The transformation that God has brought about. That's a tool that God has given. We need to be utilizing that. We need to be sharing what God is teaching us as we're going forward as well because all of that God's going to use in this disciple-making process as we have hope and um, in this broken hopelessness and uh, helplessness around us. So number one, every believer is the disciple of Jesus Christ who follows him in all of life. Let's go to number two. The study of God's word is crucial because through it, God engages us with Christ, the living word. So what's the connection between those two points? Are they connected? Is there any connection between this first point and the second point? Or are they completely fragmented and disjointed? Is there any connection between learning to study God's word and being a disciple? What do you think? Learning to study God's word is more than learning to follow him in 
Yes. Because what is the means? What's our means to be a disciple maker? Is it my own strength? What's the means to be able to be a disciple maker? To know God's word. These are, this is our mandate. This is our teaching manual right here. To the level that we know this book is the level we're making disciples in, in all of life. So let's go into this. So remember when Jesus fed the... Remember, let's go back to a, 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 an older story. Uh, Jesus, when he was feeding the 5,000, remember he was using the analogy as he fed them that he was the bread of life. And when he made that declaration that he was the bread of life, many of his disciples no longer followed him. They left him. Now listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 6. So let's go over to John chapter 6 and pick up this um, account again. We won't go into all of it, but John chapter 6, verse um, 66 to 68. John chapter 6. Verses 66 to 68. A really huge truth. Anybody got it? Go ahead and read that, please. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave. Do you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Okay, so just for the sake of the sake, I've written on the Amplified. So Jesus said to the twelve, um, you do not want to leave me too, um, to, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. So now, okay, put yourself in Peter's shoes here. Okay, what had Peter and the disciples done at this point in time? They had been following who? Jesus, right? So what had it cost them to follow Christ? What had they given up? Everything. Everything, right? They had set aside their occupation. They had set aside their status. They had set aside, and everything was, everything was at stake as they, were, as they were following Christ. So think about this. So why would Peter make this declaration, Lord, whom shall we go? Why would he say that? Why would he make this declaration? Whom shall we go? Do you get the sense and the passion that's in there? Like, why would he make that statement? Because he understood who Christ was. Yes, he understood who Christ was. And he was, and notice how it says in the Amplifies, you are our only hope. Who else are we going to go to? You alone have the words of life. And it ties together what Jesus declared in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They recognized it to that limited way that he was their only hope. He was the only one that had, had the life. And as a result, they staked everything on it. All but two of the disciples went to a martyr's grave because they recognized that he alone was their, was their only hope. So what Peter's... Um, um, Words ring in your ears. Let's go flip back to Psalms chapter 1. We're just setting the basis for this here just a little bit. Um, a little bit topical, but that's okay. Psalms chapter 1, as we, see, as we see the reality, the study of God's word is crucial because through it, God engages us with Christ, the living word. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It's the middle of our Bibles. Psalms chapter 1. Verses 1 to 3. Just give a second. Okay, go ahead and read this, please. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, Prospers. Okay, so when the book of Psalms was written, they only had the first five books of, the, of, of God's word. And so that's the law that's being referenced here. That's the word of God. So how is a believer, how is a believer blessed if, um, if he delights in God's word and his law? How, does, how, does, how is a believer blessed based on Psalms chapter 1? What's the, what's the imagery that he uses here? He's like a tree. What kind of tree? Withered, withering, one that's withering, Right? It's a healthy one. It's bearing fruit. Where is it planted? Right by, the stream. right by the stream. It has been planted. It didn't plant itself. It's been planted and it's flourishing, getting everything that it needs, to giving it purpose. Walk in victory, overcoming is for the believer. So how is it possible this can happen by delighting and meditating in God's word? 
How can we flourish? How can we have um, vitality? How can we have purpose as, as, we're, as we're just meditating God's word? How is that possible? What's the connection here? Yeah, it's the bread of life. He come comes back to this truth, the bread of life. That stream that the tree is planted, that we, the tree, are planted beside, is that stream. And that stream is God's word, isn't it? Because we're not just merely engaging with sentences as letters on the page. This is not some ordinary book as we've been talking about. This is God's very word. Every time we open up its pages, we open up the mouth of God and we open up the word of God to us personally. And we've got to see the connection. It's crucial because through it, God engages us with Christ, the living word. We're going to see that in John chapter 1 here. In one, verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so we understand that Jesus Christ is the author of this book. And so every time we engage with, the, with this book, we're engaging with Christ. These are his words. This is where he meets us. He's hovering over these, and this is where he meets us and engages us with his, with his written word. It's no wonder that God's word is living and powerful and sharp in the double-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4. Now again, coming back to this truth, why is it important that we as believers understand that we're engaging with the living word of God? Why is that important for us to be reminded of that truth? Think about it. Why is it important for us to be reminded, many of us believers for many, many years, why is it important for us to understand that this is the living word of God? Why does God want us to understand that? It's not just like reading any book. But we have an enemy, don't we? John chapter 10, verse 10. And what is that enemy wanting to do? He's wanting to kill, steal, and destroy. If he can minimize our engagement with his word, what is he doing? What is our position? He's weakening us. Are we going to flourish? Are we going to thrive? Are we going to overcome like that tree by some of the streets of living water? No. And God wants to bring us back to the reality and to the understanding. So let's dig into this. So why is it important for every believer to know how to study God's word for themselves? Why is it important that every one of us personally knows how to study God's word for ourselves? Why is that important? So that we can grow? Why else? Yeah, it's that personal means to engage with Christ. This is his primary means of engaging with us. Let me use an illustration to kind of help to illustrate this truth here. To think about it for our children. Our children will only grow and mature to the level that they learn to stand on their own two feet, right? Or look, think about the proverb, you can give a starving man a fish every day for life, or you can teach him how to fish. Then even one more, when we were amongst the Mangan, often the Mangan mothers, you know what they would do for their infants? They would take a sweet potato, and they would chew it and mash it in their mouth, and then they would take it out and feed their children. Who was getting the sweetness out of the food? Who was getting the most nourishment, the mother or the child? The mother was, wasn't it? The child wasn't. The same is true for each believer in Christ. If we wait for a teacher or a preacher to mash up God's word to feed us, then what are we missing out on? What are we missing out on? Yeah. A personal relationship, the sweetness and the nutrients that God wants to feed us through his word. Rather, God desires that each of us would learn how to chew on God's word personally and properly. This will cause our growth to skyrocket and is there ever a lot of sweetness as we begin to taste the sweetness that we dig out personally as we're engaging with God's word. So what we're going to do in Bible 101 is we're going to begin walking you through this simple Bible outline that's going to walk us through and enable us how to personally study God's word for ourselves. We're going to take a truth and we're going to practice that until we we, we all got it and then we're going to go on to the next one we're just going to kind of walk through it so this comes from the mangan this is what we did it and and we had to kind of do it in this step-by-step approach and that enabled them to be able to do it and so we're going to kind of track our way through it as we're as we're going along so does everybody have one make sure you have one if you don't there's more at the back table to kind of walk through it now notice step one begin with prayer Step number two, set your heart to engage with God's word. Step number three, initial study. Step number four, digging deeper. Uh, Step number five is application. And step number six is the sharing sharing of it and um, as we go through it. So notice here on this, step number one, the actual study of God's word doesn't begin to step three. Is that significant? Is that important? Why would we do that? Why would the actual study of God's word 
begin way down in step three, and why is prayer at the top of the list? Why do we begin there? Start with prayer, you're opening the communication between you and God. Yes, we're opening up the communication between and God. You see, this is not an academic study. We're engaging with the living word of God. We're engaging with Christ, not the smear letters on the page. And we need to, and through prayer, is a, is a means that we're humbling ourselves before God and we're coming in simple, simple humility to ask him, God, we need you to teach us. We need you to lead us into your word. Prayer is that humbling in order to receive help. Now take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1 verse 5 just to see this. And again, this is just simple introduction initially, and we're going to kind of progress all the way through as we go along. But as we go into God's word, the importance to begin with humility and dependence upon God. So all the way towards the end of our Bibles, um, they come to the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 5. And notice God's heart here. It's just huge. And another promise that he declares to us as his children and the, the necessity of engaging with his word. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 5. Go ahead and read that, please. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Okay, so if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives. How does God give? Generously. Notice notice the words. And who does he give that generously to? Oh, just the pastors, right? Just to the elite. Just those who are are kind of special. That's who he gives this, this help to, right? This wisdom. What's God's word say? To all, without how, what's, what's also his heart here? Without finding what? Without finding fault. And so as we come with humility and we bow before God and say, God, teach me, there's no fault finding with God. He's, he's generous in what he gives to his children. Prayer is not flowery, it's not formal, it's not twisting God's arm. We're simply like a child saying, God, to, like a child would say to his father, Dad, help. We're saying, God, help, teach us as we go through, and God will do so generously. So let's take this a little bit more, let's take this a little bit more personal. So as believers, as believers in Jesus Christ, as we come to God's word and we begin to study it, what are some of the, what are some of the hindrances, what are some of the thoughts that are standing against us from engaging what? What are some of the things that we're bumping up against when we think about this, that we're going to engage with God's word, we're going to study God's word? Because some of you, when you looked at this, you immediately, your heart kind of went... You kind of felt like this is impossible. What are, what, are, what, is, what are those things that we're saying is impossible? What are some of those roadblocks that we're putting up in front of us to say, I don't think I can do this? What are those things? Let's list them. No yeah, no understanding. Okay, what other, what other things have we, what other things come to mind as we think about this and this task that's going to be in front of us, we're going to start digging and learning, each of us personally, how to study God's word. Some of us are kind of struggling with this concept, thinking about it. What are those, what are those things? Let's be honest. What are those things that we're putting up to say, I don't think I can do this? It's too hard. It's too hard. Mm-hmm. Okay, what was the other one? No time. Mm-hmm. Any other? Yeah. No time, so, um, yeah, so distraction, maybe no time, uh, distraction. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. How about tried and failed? Okay? So let's stop and think about these. Let's stop and think about these for a second. And let's, let's engage. Let's think about this through. So God has given us his written word in written form. And it's his primary means that God wants to communicate with us. He desires to engage with us through his word. His word is his love letter. And so as God has given us his word, this is his heartbeat of how he's given. He's given this to us as his love letter. He loves us and he desires. He's present every time we open it. And he wants us to understand the truth of this. He's given it to protect us. He's given it to us to lead us into abundant life and to engage with him in relationship. 
Now, some of us are going to struggle to read God's word because we're saying, my reading ability is not up to snuff. But you know something? We're part of a family. We're part of the family of God, and we help each other. And it's important that we continue to engage and not let a handicap prevent us from engaging his word because here's the truth. The study of God's word is crucial because through it, God engages us with Christ, the living word. And we need to understand that. And he is the enabler. Remember, he, uh, Genesis, James 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of what? Who gives what? Generously. And we need to go forward. And this is not a, this is not a, a stick. This is not a, um, a rebuke. But just continue to say, let's take God at his word. And let's go forward with confidence that he will enable. Because he desires to engage with every last one of us through his word. God's word is so important to leave it lying on the shelf and waiting for somebody else to teach us. Sadly, for some of us, these here are just merely excuses, aren't they? Isn't that some of these just merely an excuse? And when we hold this up to prevent us from engaging with God's word, what are we what are we withholding from ourselves? God's blessing. Maturing, a richness that's that's out of this world, we're actually we're actually allowing the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy. And God wants us to humble ourselves before Him and say, God, your word is absolutely, absolutely important. And I'm going to humble myself and recognize that your truth is absolutely important for me to engage with you, with, with, the living, with the living Christ. And we're going to humble ourselves before him to allow us. So think about all that we've learned in Bible 101. He created us for himself. He pursued us in our sin and provided our one means of rescue. He's the one that, that enabled us. He's the one that drew us to himself. He is the one that will enable us to engage with him through his word. And we need to understand his means. So think about this illustration. If I ask my children to go work in my garden, how much of the resources do they need to provide for that job? If I ask them to go work in my garden, do I not as the parent provide everything they need for resources to do the job? And so too it is for the children of God. He will provide all the tools and the resources that we need if we'll simply ask, ask him to provide it. Yes, we have to follow in obedience to do our part, but he's promised to help. And as we begin to study God's word, we first need to have a, have a translation of God's word that we can understand. And so many of us struggle to understand it because we have too difficult of a translation. And we need to go find an easier translation. We need to be careful. There's some oversimplified translations. So you need to be careful because they take some great liberties. But find a translation that we can, we, can comprehend, that we can comprehend. And then as we go to God's word... We just need to understand that, that, that we need to begin looking at God's word so that we begin becoming familiar with our Bibles so that it's not so foreign, so difficult for us to begin engaging. Look at where the different books of the Bible are. Understand the introductions for each of the books. Again, God didn't give that originally, the introductions, nor did he give the chapter headings or the verses. Those were added later, but we understand that each book has, a, has an introduction and there's cross-references, there's different helps in our Bibles. Get familiar with our Bible. That will take down some of the roadblocks, some of the barriers, that will prevent us from in, engaging with God's word. And so as we walk through that. And then as well, what we've done is we've given you a handout with all of the list of, of the, all 66 books listed here. What we want to encourage in the next couple of weeks is let's begin memorizing if you have never done it, let's begin memorizing the books, the, the, the books of the Bible in order. And so start challenge yourself as family to start memorizing it because again, to the familiarity that we have with the names and the titles of the different books will actually ease us in, in helping us to understand and to engage with God's word. So let's start memorizing them. And so I've listed out the authors for some information, a rough date, uh, uh, kind of as best as we know. And so start using that in these next, in these next couple of weeks. And, um, and so then when we get into the next um, Bible 103 lesson, then we're going to dig into, into the next part of this. But the study of God's word is crucial because through it, God engages us with the living word, um, with Christ, the living word. So I pray that we understand this truth as we're, as we're engaging as the disciple of Jesus Christ. The potential is astounding. 
The richness that's available for us as believers in Jesus Christ is absolutely incredible. Let's go full on with Christ. Let's be intentional. Let's be purposeful. Let's be all in. And I like this quote by C.D. Studd. It says, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. And so as we dig into these, these truths of God's word, we've seen God's word has not only impacted my own life as I grew in my faith and my engagement with God's word, but you know what? As we saw, as we saw the Mangan people engaging with the living word of God, it transformed their life and they're going on to maturity at the rate they are because they're learning to engage with the living word of God. And that's what we want, God wants each of us to engage with.